Oh, yeah. This is my kayak. Get yourself one. Fish on. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my God. Look at that tank. That's a toad, brother. Golly. All right, guys, welcome to day two of our Ocean City, Maryland adventure. Uh, the tides weren't right for a morning fishing trip on the Pocomo. So what we've decided to do is go over to a local tackle manufacturer uh, called Rumblefish, and we're going to show you guys how soft plastic lures are made. So stay tuned. It should be fun. All right, guys, so we made it over to Rumblefish, and we're going to hook up with this knucklehead right here, Mr. Jake Evans. And it's not Jake at State Farm. It's no. Jake at Rumblefish. <laughs> and then he's got his cohort over there, partner in crime. I'll let him introduce his, his partner. Uh, I don't know what the guy does, to be honest with you. I know this guy builds baits and looks good in hats. What, what is it you do again, sir? <laughs> Everybody, this is Kevin Wolf. He's the man. He's the designer. He does all the behind-the-scenes stuff and tons of the tackle making as well. Exactly. He does the important part, which is always crazy because sometimes you see the person that's the face of things, and you don't see the people that are doing the toiling behind the scenes to make that possible. So, Jake, here's the deal. We came to Ocean City last time, and we were introduced to you guys and your brand, and I was blown away. Actually, I think the day that I talked to you, you're like, I'm quitting my job tomorrow. Yeah. Did you quit your job? Uh, oh, tomorrow? absolutely. So absolutely. he quit his job, is doing this full time. I really love people that are all in on their passion because I actually elected to retire from the Navy, had a good career going, was making really good money, had great benefits to do the same thing. Yeah. So I applaud passion. I say this all the time. You will never have everything you want if you're not willing to risk everything you have. Amen. And so the fishing industry is is literally riddled with these types of stories so one of the things that i wanted to do jake not just to show off your brand and your company but the passion behind what you guys do because this is a passion project you're in a industrial complex in a small building and i want to be here now so that when rumblefish is a big mm -hmm. name we can say i remember when right yeah. you guys are making stuff in an industrial garage basically yes, love it yes, love sir. that part about it so jake talk to us about rumblefish Tell us a little bit about how it came to be, how you ended up in this partnership with Kevin, and then let's show these folks how to make a soft plastic lure. Yeah. Cool. Started many, many years ago. I remember being a little kid walking into a tackle store, looking at the wall and just thinking about how is that stuff made? You know, it was pre-internet. You didn't have all the access that we do now to all these technologies. And I just had to figure out how to crack that egg. So over the years, I you know figured it out little piece by little piece. Man, years go by, moved from Southern California all the way out here to the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Left the biggest bass place in existence to come out here. Love it out here, fell in love with it. Kevin and I have been friends for years. Um, a few years ago, we started talking and, and got together. I, I had never found anybody that I could partner up with that really understood what I was trying to do, felt the passion, and, and could get involved the way that he, uh, he just dropped everything and got into it. So we decided one day to just go for it, man, so and now we're here. The, here's one of the things that entrepreneurs say. The fastest way to sink a ship is to put the word partner in front yeah. of it. <laughs> but He's but, not right, or he's not wrong. That's good that you, got, you found somebody that you could click with and you're willing to go all in with, right? Yeah, that's a, yeah. That means you both have your backs to the wall and you have to make things work. And I, I love that entrepreneurial spirit. So listen, you came to Ocean City and it's funny that you say you left the big bass capital of the world. We talked a little bit off camera about how he's got this picture of Mike Long up here, Sir Snags a lot, but Mike Long was a big bass master back in the day. And Jake actually said he leaves it up there to remind himself to stay humble, stay grounded, and don't make the same mistakes that that knucklehead did. But it's interesting that you said you came from Southern California or California and you love it here. And I'll tell you, I'm the same way. I live in Alabama. I've lived in the South, the land of giants. I go to Florida, I go to Texas, I go to all those places. What I love about Ocean City is the diversity and the fact that you can get people fired up about fishing, not big fish fishing, because you gotta be a fisherman first. I tell people the evolution of fishing is any fish, yeah. many fish, big fish, mini big fish and then <laughs> method fish and so it's funny that you've got these up here because swim bait fishing is a type of method fish in other words when you first start fishing you want to catch any fish any way that you can then you want to catch as many fish as you can then you want to start trying to catch big fish then you want to start catching as many big fish as you can and then you want to start trying to catch fish a certain way mm -hmm. and then you want to try to catch big fish a certain way and if you look into the swim bait culture these guys that throw these big hunks of plastic and hunks of wood those are, in my opinion, the most diehard 
method fishermen out there. I would say fly fishermen are somewhat in that category, but fly fishing can also be a numbers thing. When you're throwing these, you're fishing for giants. So he comes from that background, but comes to a place called Ocean City, Maryland, and falls in love with it because it really is one of those places. Man, oh, yeah. you got to get people excited about fishing first. We were fishing yesterday for the Catch-22 Challenge, and it was really cool that they got this walkway that goes all the way around the lake. You don't see that everywhere. You don't see that many places. There was a family of six out there, four kids and the parents, and all of them could fish, mm -hmm. and all of them were catching fish, but they're not overpopulated. So that's what I love about Ocean City. You guys know that I am here trying to plug Ocean City because I love it. You know that I'm here because we're trying to have a KBF rally here next year, which we'll be partnering with these guys. For. Looking forward to it. So, man, let's just jump right into it. What bait uh, do you think is the most appropriate right now for us to show these folks how to make? Swim baits. Swim baits. Absolutely. You can't Duh. go wrong with them. You can fish them in fresh and salt water. You can fish them coast to coast. Doesn't matter where you're at. You can smoke them on them. So I've been very fortunate over the years to kind of see the behind the scenes. I've got a lot of friends that are, you know, lure, craft, uh, more tinkerers, though. They like to make their own custom baits, not making custom baits for the masses or for even for, you know, for resale. And so not very many people have actually seen a swim bait or a soft plastic, even in this form right here, where, where it comes out of a multi-cavity mold and they're connected together. You know, then again, you've got other options like these these smaller baits right here, which we'll talk a little bit more about. I think it's a unique offering that these guys have, but not very many folks have even seen soft plastics in this form. So Jake, take us through the process of making a soft plastic lure, uh, where you start, how somebody who's watching, who wants to get into this on their own can start, and then we'll wrap it up with your favorites that you guys offer here at Rumblefish. So right on. the floor is yours, man. Let's take, yeah. take us through making a soft plastic. Lure. To make a soft plastic bait, first you gotta start with the plastic. It's the most important part. It's plastisol, it's an oil-based plastic. It starts out as a liquid. Looks like milk, more or less. You heat it up, it turns crystal clear, and then that's when the magic happens. Well, you add all it, your colors, all your dyes, let's, let's do let's it. Let's do it. Let me grab a bucket. And along the way, when Jake is making lures, I'm going to ask him questions for the benefit of, of being able to educate you guys on how do you do things like laminates? How do you do color blends? How do you do all of those things? Which I'm sure he's going to be a wealth of knowledge uh, to share with you guys. So here we go in how to make a soft plastic lure. One of the most important things about manufacturing plastic worms is to begin with, you got to have your plastic mixed right. I can't tell you how many people online I see having issues with making baits and doing all these things. Biggest problem, mix your plastic correctly. So the next part of the process is just getting the plastic into the cups. I use a microwave. There's many different ways to do it. Some people, you know, the higher up the ladder you go, you're using big giant injection molding machines. I've seen people doing it in little like hot pans in their garage. Everybody has their own way of doing it. This is the way I personally grew up doing it, love doing it. I love a microwave. It's quick, it's fast, and you can heat up a ton of plastic. I recommend Anytime you make a color and you're getting your recipe down, doing it in multiple cups at a time. I shoot for four cups of each color. You seem to get a really consistent outcome that way. I mean, obviously you can always do more or less, but four seems to be a great number to start with. So all I'm doing now is just transferring the plastic from the bucket itself into my Pyrex glass. That way I can get in the microwave and start cooking. What we're gonna start with is a two color pour here. So I'm getting eight cups ready. That way I can make two separate colors that we can work together with. All right, getting close now. Now is where the magic happens and the fun begins. We have several microwaves in the shop. This is my old tried and true trusty. She's been coast to coast. There's been more plastic pumped through this than half of Hollywood. I got my, all my numbers are gone. You can't tell any of this stuff. I just know when you put in four cups, that's the magic mark right there. For those of y'all that missed it, that was a plastic surgery joke. He just slid in there perfectly. <laughs> I like it. Now, Jake, while we're waiting on this to heat up, um, do you recommend doing this with your at home microwave or is that going to be some no, issues you're going no, to have to you're, with the wife if you uh yeah you definitely don't want to do this in your kitchen uh, there's a lot of fumes that come off of this stuff and on top of that you definitely don't want to cook food in the same microwave you're cooking toxic plastic so disclaimer right here for all of the crayon eaters <laughs> do not do this in your home microwave or one that you intend to reuse to eat food from so again disclaimer no food is Don't cooked in these microwaves. Food after you cook your plastic in the microwave. And I've seen people use things like, 
you know, little stovetop burners, you know, like yeah. the things you did uh, beakers in yep. in high school. I've That's seen, how I, I learned. I've literally seen people use actual ovens. Yeah. Just put it in an oven in, a, in square pans that sit in a wood frame so that they can grab the wood handles and take it out. But like you said, you got to figure out what works for you. Obviously, microwaves are readily available. You can buy used ones on all the marketplaces, social media places, things like that. You can go to a pawn shop, yeah. and you can buy them brand new, honestly, at Walmart now for like 85 bucks. It's yeah. not like microwaves, when they came out when I was, I don't know, in my teens, they're like four times as expensive as they are now, and they're like three times as big. Plus, you felt tingling in all your hair follicles when you turn it on. <laughs> They've just gotten a lot safer, you know? That's a fact. So what do we got going on here? Let's talk about some of the tools of the trade. We got a big glove here that looks like it was involved in a murder. Yeah, And then we maybe got this several. little dude right here. So explain to the folks... <laughs> what exactly this is and what it's for. This is an infrared temperature checker. Get your little red dot here, that way you can check the plastic as it goes. Uh, plastic melts to the temperature you want at about 350 degrees. So anywhere between 340 and 360, it's kind of at its optimal temperature, but you don't want it to get too high because then it starts to discolor. So this way I can keep it checked, always know what the temperature is, that way I can keep all my colors blending right. And I won't tell you, but depending on the temperature, you can make your plastic do different stuff. That's how you get some of the tricks in there. But we'll save that for later. So while we're waiting on these to finish heating up, and I said I was going to fill this with a lot of tips, I'm going to give you a kayak fishing tip based on one of these infrared temperature checkers. A lot of folks out there make these claims about this color of kayak or that color of kayak is too hot. Mm. So what I will tell you is that most plastics have what's called a specific heat, which means that's as hot as they can get and retain their characteristics before they start to break down. So back when I made a black fishing kayak one time and I put it on the internet and the internet was a, a, you know, on fire with like, man, I think it'll be so hot. Here's what we figured out. We actually took a temperature, or infrared temperature checker like this and we laid out six different color kayaks in the parking lot in the middle of the summer hmm. in South Carolina, which by the way, is hot as the surface of hell that time of year. <laughs> and we infrared temperature checked them after they had been out there for like three and a half hours in direct sunlight. The black kayak, the blue kayak and the red kayak were less than a degree apart, and the tan kayak, which everybody thought would be the lightest color, was only about a degree and a half cooler than the black kayak, right? Interesting. And then the lime green kayak, which actually was a little brighter than the sand colored kayak, which was the lightest color, was actually the coolest, but again, only like a half a degree. So when you think about these things that are certain colors and they're just gonna get hot, Shirts are hotter because you're wearing it and you feel it a lot more as a human being. Hats are a lot hotter and things like that. But when it comes to the color of plastic for fishing kayaks, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't change the, I'll be honest with you, I don't think most people could touch their hand to one kayak versus another and tell the difference between a degree or a degree and a half. So since we had to fill the time waiting on this plastic heat up and I haven't seen one of these things in a minute, I figured I'd share that little story with you guys a little bit of insight on the plastic color if you've ever said no i don't want a camo because it's going to get too hot it probably won't but tried and true like i said you put it on that dot and when that thing dings you're you're right there that's what i love about it i like it. that i like the technical aspect of it just put it on that dot right there yeah well i can tell you exactly I don't how know long what, it is i don't but. know what it is but it's a sharpie marker buddy yeah 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 after you clean it a couple times you wipe everything off and yeah. it's like oh that's not good yeah just took all the numbers off yeah oh, we'll just use a sharpie <laughs> sharpies fix almost everything Duct tape or sharpies, Duct right? Duct tape or sharpies, yeah. <laughs> WD-40. That's right. You call it? I call it violent. Violent? Because it's kind of violent, yeah, yeah. violent, violent. Yeah, no, that one, uh, we're selling a ton of them right really? now. That, okay. that, I guess in the, in the salt, they just eat it up. They yeah. burn it up. A guy, uh, we, were at a, we were at a little event Monday in Snow Hill. Uh, first like, Friday. First, oh yeah, first Friday. Um, you set up like a little vendor station, stuff like that. We had a gentleman, C.L. Marshall, he's a local guy, author of some books and stuff like that. Don't know him from Adam. You know, I, I know of him just because it's a small town. We're not friends or anything like that. He walks right up and he goes, oh my gosh, I didn't know you guys were local. He goes, I won eight grand off that bait two weeks ago in the Tangier Classic. And oh I'm my. like, no kidding. You should have let a brother know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, yeah, and he did go on. He told us that he, you know, he was on a radio show and he did talk about it. And we looked it up and sure as can be, he I did. like this little Tennessee shad looking color too. Oh yeah. That kind of. She's hot. Melting color, molten color. What do you call this color? Tennessee shad. Ten okay, cool. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. I try to keep them as, you yeah. know, as simple as I can. So, electric chicken? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I call it funky chicken, but okay, yeah. same, same six thing. of one. Uh, Just pearl. Pearl, okay. Green pumpkin? Green pumpkin. Baby bass? Yes, sir. Right. That's one of my favorites right Pretty there. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, you know? I mean, we keep it. We Green keep, pumpkin? Yep, yes, sir. Okay, cool. 
We call that one frost. I don't know what they call it. It's something like ice. Ice. Yeah, there you go. Thing. There you go. And the difference between just white or pearl and frost or ice is that it's got the clear in the belly with the glitter, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of times looks like an injured fish and the scales are coming off. Right. Which, by the way, if you ever want to do a really cool trick on a topwater popper, mm -hmm. take a long strand of flashaboo from the fly, or not flashaboo, uh, crystal flash mm -hmm. from the fly time world and tie a double knot off the back of it. When you pop that popper, if you let that long strand hang off the back, mm -hmm. it looks like that fish was injured and the scales are falling away from it and fish just murder that. In fact, I'll do a video about that in the That's future. That's a hot show you tip guys. right there. I used to do it for fly fishing with these little uh, uh, shad patterns for um, spade fish and some of the saltwater yeah. fish, and you put that long string off the back, and it looks like, because I saw a fish hit a fish, and it was crippled, and it swam away, and another fish came up, but there was scales just mm -hmm. dissipating in the water with the current, and it made a string of glitter. Yeah. So how do you mimic that? You find something that mimics it, and just right. do it, and it works like a champ. Cool, man. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Dude, that's some good looking stuff. Now, you didn't have this series when we were here last, did you? I didn't have it all. No, okay. I was just starting a portal. Okay, cool. Yeah, when you guys got here, we were just, yeah, I mean, we like weren't you, even moved in pretty yet. Pretty much literally had like that pegboard. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is all, I mean, we've been ramping all this stuff up. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I have all these colors and recipe books for the mm -hmm. most part or in my head, but yeah, I hadn't even, I hadn't even proofed them all out yet. So that's that one's a little, a little bit different, little, that's man. A that's a little different. So that's actually more of an ocean color uh the big brands call it chicken on a chain mm -hmm. it's i mean it's not much different than your baby bass except it's I'm, got the darker back yeah in it, so. that stuff's fire right there oh yeah bro it's good looking stuff man yeah that was my test bait when i took that to a pond just to see how it swam i think i got a four and a half pounder too bad the gopro died and i didn't catch anything on film but <laughs> oh, what are you gonna do i set that thing back in the water and it mud splashed me from head to toe it was great there's some good looking jig heads. Yeah. Where, where do you get your jig heads done? Or do we you do guys them. do them? We do them you all do them? in house, yeah. Yeah. Paint them all, you bet. And I mean, these are some good looking swim jigs too. Like really good looking swim jigs. Captain Bruce likes them things. You pair, you pair keep... them up with the oh, swim yeah. baits. And... Oh yeah. Yeah, man. Got some cool little underspins and then little back guts. Put a little three inch uh, paddle oh, tail on the back yeah. of that thing. Watch out, buddy. Yeah, and watch my son dump about like a five and a half. Six and a half pound bass on one of those things the other day, right on shore. Poor little guy broke his heart. Yeah, that's pretty, bro. I like those. You very rarely can find the downsized ones that still have the right size blade. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's one of the nice things about making it yourself. You put whatever you want that's on it. True. But you're right, though, because normally you get that little thing and they put a little tiny blade on it, but you got you to gotta kick yeah, it up a notch. You got to get some flash on that thing. Yeah, and so that paired with some of the stuff over here. Is yeah, cool. yeah. So, for, you know, for like our crappie line or this, like even just ponds in general, like you get your little underspin, you know, oh, 16 juicy, ounce, eight, eighth ounce, and you put that on the back of it. Man, you give that to a little kid and you put them on any body of water and there, it, it's game on. It's game on. Or, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, of course. I'm sometimes a little kid. Of course, you're adults as well. Look at that tiny little thing. Pretty. Yeah, we got those and we started These putting... will come in handy for the Catch-22 challenge when I just have to catch them. Yeah, you know what I mean? pair it with a little willow blade too. There you oh, go. I mean, yeah, they, uh, That's clean. I've seen some pretty good sized bass caught on those. Some pickerel, I mean, and tons of crappie, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're, they're solid, man. Some good stuff. Sweet. I did hear a ding. Let's go check Let's some go plastic. Check yeah. All right, so it looks like Jake has got the plastics right to that juicy desired temperature that he's looking for. I'm going to get out of the here and let the master do his work. So, Jake, take it from here, man. All right. Well, come on in here. So, now we got the plastic heated up. It's at the right temperature. Bubbles are out of it. Everything's ready to roll. So, now's where the magic happens. This is where your formula comes into play to get your color just right. So, I can't show you all of the secrets, and I can't give you my formula, of course. But, hang out, check out the stuff, and let's make some magic. So over here, you got to add your colors. You have all sorts of different colors. You have liquid colors, you have pearl colors, highlights, you name it. It's all right there at your disposal. So again, I'm not going to give you my actual recipe, but you can see what I'm working with here. Got some highlight powder. Just don't look too close at the measurements. Just don't look too close at the measurements. So while Jake's doing that, let me explain what he means. Guys like him that, that build a brand, spend a lot of time developing these ratios and color schemes and things like that. And it's not that he's being evasive, it's just there's a lot of time, effort, energy, and work that goes into this. But that's all also part of the fun. So if you decide to start 
building or making lures of your own, then you're going to be able to experiment with the different additives. I've seen people add everything from glitter to Kool-Aid to their lures to get the right color. And so we're going to respect the fact that he obviously doesn't want to give up his formula. He worked hard to, accomplishment, to accomplish it, and it actually translates to every single color that they make. You have to sit, sit there developing these recipes. Now we're about to actually see the magic happen. All right, so I added all the goodies to the plastic. This is one of my favorite parts, is getting the plastic all stirred up. This is when you actually get to see what the color looks like and how it's all gonna come out in the long run. You gotta give it a good stir. One of the most important parts is stir, stir, stir. When you think you've stirred enough, stir it a little bit more. Beginners out there, that's one of the hottest tips I can give you. Stir, stir, stir. When you think you're done, do it again. Think you're close, add a few more minutes to it. All right, we're getting somewhere now. So what this is gonna wind up being is the top color of the swim bait. It's got a nice little violet blue shine to it, somewhere between uh, pink and purplish. And I'll tell you what, when that light hits this, man, it pops. It just glows out there. So that one's about stirred up correctly. Go over here now, this is the belly color, so you got more of a pearl, and you got some scale patterns in it. When this color gets all mixed up, you have a nice light belly color with a little bit of shine. Light hits this, man, and it glows. It's a vicious color combination. All right, looks like we're about there. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put them back in the microwave just for a few seconds to get that color, the temperature just right, and we're gonna get our molds prepared, so we'll be ready to pour. I don't need much, just hit it for about another 30 seconds. That way you just get every, everybody all in the same boat together. Get the temperatures about right, about even, and after that, that's when the fun begins. So Jake, you mentioned early on that you can actually modify your color by how much you heat it. Mm -hmm. And so is that something that's also part of your recipe when you've got your recipe laid out so that way you can get a consistent color batch over and over and over well, again? Well, the most important part about the temperature and the heating of it is if you overcook it, you scorch the plastic. So it'll tend to turn a yellowish color. Okay. So most important, especially when you're doing transparents, is you gotta keep that temperature low and you gotta keep it even. Microwaves, that's the one downfall, is they go from zero to 100 real fast. Right. You have about 30 seconds before your whole batch is done. So you got to pay close attention. Yeah, if you overheat it, only thing you can do with it is turn it black. So right. I've literally known folks that order plastisol before they get it in. They open up the bucket and it looks like milk and they contact the company and say, mm -hmm. hey, you sent me the wrong color. Well, the color doesn't <laughs> come from the bucket per se. It comes from how you mix it. So here yep. we go. All right. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to go... We're going to go big dogs first, 5.6 inch swim baits, one of my favorites. This was one of those baits that on test... Can you test open that real oh, yeah, quick yeah, and yeah. show the folks kind of so that they understand how the magic happens? So this is what the inside looks like. You have, obviously, this is a two-part bait, two-part mold. What you have over here, these little metal sheets, those are actually the hook slots. So in your baits, like any, any fluke type, anything like that that has a belly slot in it, that's how that's created, a little insert inside of your plastic. You can have, uh, they actually make some inserts that are even with the belly, so it actually doesn't. It makes it so it's just a, a solid piece in there. But so that's what your plastic looks like. You wind up injecting it through this top port here, and it fills it up, and it just makes it just right. So let's get this bad boy back together. So in the word of molding, that little extra part is called a pull. These are cavity molds, and the thing that you take out is called a pull. And so the more complicated you make a lure, the more pulls you have to have, and then the directions change. So that's what's your limiting factor for having ports and slots and things in every direction because you're limited by what you can do with the uh, layout of the mold, basically. So. Sweet, sweet. So moving into this now, this is about ready to go. Of course, I have the wrong glove. Um, some of the tools of the trade. Now, there's lots of different ways to pour plastics. I grew up personally hand pouring plastics in Southern California. That's a really big thing. It's how you get your multiple colors and really, really fancy stuff. Now we've moved into the 21st century, and, and your average Joe can pick up tools like this. It's an injector. You can do them single injector, or in this case, we're doing a two-color pour. So this is set up for a double. You can also make it a triple-color pour. It's like some of your RoboWorms and stuff like that. So coming. So so for those of you that don't know, when you see the language hand pour, if you see how labor intensive this process is, imagine how much more labor intensive a hand pour. So when you're looking at those custom lures that say hand poured, that means instead of using this injection molder, 
the artisan, the person that's building these lures, is actually pouring the plastic into the mold by hand. Yeah. AKA hand, hand pour. pour. The time difference it would take you to learn how to hand pour a bait versus injecting is years. years. I mean, it took me, it was probably a year or two before I had a store, even remotely store quality looking bait learning to hand pour. Your average guy with a couple YouTube videos can get, can get into the ballpark of making store quality baits like that. With the right tools, you can get it done. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna be able to map out these colors quite like that. That's where some of the really fancy stuff comes in. But so, we're ready to go now. What I have, you have your belly and your top. On a lot of molds these days, it'll tell you back belly, so you know where you're going, what you're working with. Injector, this is, a, this is the melting block. So once you hook it up, that's what blends your two plastics together and they come out right next to each other. So in this case, we got back, we got belly. Let's make some magic happen. All right. She's hot, she's ready to go. All it takes is a little push, just like that. Move on to the next slot. Boom, just like that. And that's a wrap. Now we give her a couple minutes to cool and we'll see what she looks like. So while we're doing that, let me explain a little bit to you about how this whole process works. You know, fluids are not compressible, right? So the way that you know that you've got it down in there, which is where this cap is, is basically the top of this port. So when you open that thing up, it's gonna come out looking like, just like that. And this little fill reservoir right here is the, uh, the fudge factor. If you don't do it just right, you've got that little bit of margin of error, but by forcing the pressure and getting that plastic down into the mold, you're going to get the mold filled. This is your kind of your little buffer right here. And then this is just the run through uh, on the top. So that way when you pull it out, it's all kind of connected together. And you know, I've gone to lure manufacturers, like you said, that are up to scale where they're pulling these things out of like, so this is a three cavity mold. I've seen 150 cavity molds and I'm sure that there's even bigger oh, yeah. that work on a plate where it rotates over it. The injectors slide in and mate and do a press on a machine and it fills 150 oh, yeah. baits and they're bringing these things out that you can't hold with your arms. Oh, right. And they're hanging them on clotheslines. Yep. There's so many of them. So, but this is a really cool, you know, simple uh, layout and it's easy to show folks at home who've never tried this before. It's something that now that I've moved to Alabama and I'm starting to kind of reset up my headquarters there, I want to get back into because I used to do this back before Austin was born nice. and haven't done it since then. So oh, man, I'd cool. love to get you set up. Hell yeah. All right. After a few minutes of it cooling, she's probably ready to pull out. Let's see what we have. Moment of truth. Just like that, you have beautiful store quality baits ready to smash huge fish in any body of water around you. Well guys, there you have it. That's how you make a soft plastic lure. And like I said, with this cavity pull, all you do is pull this thing out of the bottom and that reveals the hook pocket or the slot. You can get really crazy, but it increases the maintenance time, it increases the labor time, and it increases the complexity of the mold and the cost of the mold. Absolutely. So a lot of times, manufacturers try to keep things as simple as possible. It doesn't need to be much more complicated than that to go out there and smash some bass. In fact, I think I'm going to take these three with me and catch a fish on the actual lure that we made here in this video. As long as that's cool with you. That's Absolutely. Cool with you. All right, man. I appreciate it. Guys, listen, check out Rumble Fish and all the stuff that they make, Rumble Fishing. I'll put that link in the description box to their socials, to their website. I think we're also going to work out a special deal for you KBF members. So be on the lookout Ooh. for an email where we offer a special, some special, you know, insider stuff from the folks at Rumble Fishing, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Right on, thank you, fish, sir. Man. Let's do it. Cool. All right, so Jake, now that the camera's not rolling anymore, can you give us the exact formula to make this color? Wait a minute, mm -hmm. you want exactly how I make that thing? <laughs> yeah, come on, man. Where are you from? <laughs> Here, you can have my left arm. What you do is you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and different, and, and that's all you gotta do. You just gotta take a little bit of this and a pinch of that and a dash of this. It's kind of like asking your mama for the recipe for her favorite dish. She ain't giving it up, come on. <laughs> a lot of hours invested in figuring that stuff out. Actually, let me tell you like the real reason why I really like these guys. Y'all follow me over here. So any shop where the guys not only kayak fish, but they got their kayaks in the shop. I mean, like, 
how bad can they be, right? They're kayak fishermen, so, I mean, come on. Reminds me of the old days at Hook One and the old KBF headquarters where just your gear was just on top of you. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's perfect. That's why I love these guys. And that's why we're tomorrow we're going fishing, right? Yeah, we're going fishing tomorrow. We're going fishing tomorrow. And... No, 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 no. We're going catching tomorrow. 